The Blue Orchid Leaves falling into the empty streets alongside the brisk autumn wind joined to make a silent crashing sound near the Capitol building. Gray skies tinted with hues of lilac made for yet another somber evening in the city of Topeka. Artisans made their craft, businessmen sold their product, and children played. Unity was the city. Birds opened their nares for breath, inhaling the brisk, subtly polluted oxygen in the atmosphere. The sun went to sleep as the constellations became visible. So did the city. Repetition was commonplace, while difference, only imaginable. Dreams as sweet as the now-in-season persimmon fell upon the doctor, a good omen considering an unnerving operation the next morning. Children dreamed of toys, teenagers dreamed of love, and adults dreamed of change. Morning. A soon-to-be grandmother bought outfits for her sugar plum, a gift considering the mother's infertility. The grandfather lost himself in his preparations to spoil his long-awaited grandson. Flying paper airplanes, fishing, teaching him about girls. He could hardly wait to immerse the child in what he perceived as good old Americana. Their daughter was continuing the cycle of life, and her son would too. Her abdomen was split, accompanied by wailing from both the baby and the mother. The now grandparents caught a glimpse of baby William, and, although obvious, attempted to conceal their exhilaration until the numbness generated by their daughter's anesthesia wore off. It did. The mother, Marjorie, cuddled her former tenant. The hospital telephoned the father, Jeffrey, who was in Biloxi with a couple of business associates, and was calculating his wife's parturition. His sentimental nature had been compromised by his role of youngest sibling of four male brothers, and he attempted to showcase toughness as a result. He would rather others perceive him as a jerk than an empathetic. His father, grandfather, forefathers, every matriarch in Jeffrey's ancestry had asserted his masculinity. It is a system that has worked ever since, so why upset that cycle? The tradition would continue, and William would follow suit. His children and their children would follow it too, simply because that was the way it was. In terms of his childhood, Jeffrey's parents neglected him, and his father invested time in his older brothers. This attentional disparity created a grudge that Jeffrey would have toward both his brothers and his father perpetually. Although not much better, his mother gave him attention. Chores became her love language to him as he was able to distract himself from his paternal void. Weekly trips to Sister Maria's home quelled his mother's fear that he would end up like his father and ensured that she would not be held responsible for his soul. Orthodox in her beliefs, religion trumped leisure activity, diversity, and logic. Her rigid moral beliefs influenced her children in their perception of everyday dealings. Now homogenous in their perceptions, her children would view the world in the same way she did. It had been this way for past generations. Religion would creep its way into the next generation as a thief breaks into a home and robs both material possessions and happiness from an unsuspecting family. When Jeffrey grew up and his mother could no longer influence him, he abandoned the beliefs his mother had instilled in him. Transition from altar boy to college carouser was the last thing his mother wanted to see. The foundations she had instilled in him were smashed like the beer bottles Jeffrey had dropped in his drunken stupor. His breath reeked of cognac while his body slumped into his wrinkled business suit and unpressed, unpressed pants. He worked under division for a record label. He was the best in his division. Apathy toward his physical appearance made his colleagues doubt his abilities. He quit. He needed to ref reflect on his purpose in life, for he could not stand the raging headaches much longer. His prescription ran out and so did his sanity. His intelligence could not save him from addiction. He became immersed in psychedelia and relinquished his desire for the future. The future was then, the present was now. Implications were foreign to him. Lack of money did not matter until, until he left the Netherlands. Visiting the Netherlands was on his bucket list ever since he was a child. In his obsession with pointy wooden shoes he had watched Dutch dancers wear when performing folk dances faded as the tulips did during the Amsterdam winters. He brought all his savings to the hotel in Rosse Bert. Red-lighted brothels magnified the city and contrasted with the light blue sky. His libido cost him, sa him, cost him his savings, but once again the future was of no concern to him. His philosophy was to enjoy life and worry about it later. But there was no later. The cycle would continue as it had done for previous generations. Jeffrey was a boy who was blessed with a God-given gift and ability to sell. This gift enhanced his ability to lie, in which he would use deceit as a means to convince buyers to purchase his product. His sex-driven trip to the Netherlands left him penniless. Poverty was the biggest motivator in prompting him to get a job at a cinema. The issue was that he had no interest in working there. Tasks that forced him to clean the gum strategically placed under theater seats, clean out putrid restrooms, and worst of all, welcome the guests into a theater, theater became the first reason that he regretted his frivolous money-spending habits in the past. Jeffrey's awkward exchanges with customers made him internally cringe. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't his fault that his social skills were poor, but working there was. Repercussions had entered into his vocabulary. 
When he had enough money to purchase a one-room bathroom studio apartment, he decided to get his life back in check. Sure, his past actions could be blamed on adolescence, but it was also an issue struggled by others in his lineage. His great-grandmother was a medic who worked on reviving Union soldiers fighting in the Battle of Gettysburg. Her husband was very closely related to a prince from Norway, which provided the couple with a large grant of money for their good relations with the prince. His great-grandmother was a gambler. Believing God had come to her in a vision to bet it all in, at a nearby casino, her and her husband experienced consequential financial ruin. The severity of the tragedy led to her husband filing a divorce, an action unheard of during the middle 19th century America. Her situation parallels Jeffrey's financially unsound decision to travel across Europe and pursue his carnal desires and the repercussions of his actions. Like great-grandmother, like great-grandson. It was a generational curse rather than a tradition. Marjorie was a similar case. Conservatism ran in their blood. Their DNA was bound by tradition, and their cells functioned to spread religion. She grew up with a mother whose main goal was to remain abstinent from the influence of worldly desires. Her father was in co complete juxtaposition with her mother, and common sentiment from both her and his family demonstrated their repugnance to his dissimilarity. A graduate of Yale, he was well-versed in late 19th century political affairs and conveyed his liberal ideology by advocating for crazy women such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Their ideals made them, their ideals made them outcasts in, in antebellum, Amer antebellum America, and the right to vote was reserved for those who worked and provided for the family. The manifestation of women's roles in domestic affairs generated a society that focused on men. They were the reason for an independent America and freedom from those damned Brits and loyalists. It was men who helped create a rugged American society, economy and society that was self-sufficient. It was men who defeated Mexico in the Amer Mexican-American War. Good old America was the reason for happiness. The happiest, most successful, and freest nation in the world. Critics of this fact are traitors and don't deserve residence in such a country. God was the reason for every success experienced by America. The devil, along with pride and desire, was the reason for her shirk shortcomings. Marjorie's father didn't share these views. In fact, he did not believe in the afterlife. He didn't believe in God. Frankly, he didn't believe in anything, a possible contributor to his cynicism to religious coercers. It just wasn't his prerogative. His parents were ashamed of their brilliant son. God had given him everything, intelligence, reasoning, and a handsome figure, and he dismissed it as a mere result of an explosion. His parents took their prayers for a change, for a change in their son's heart to the grave. It wasn't God's timing, apparently. He would change, though, as every man changes his opinion on religion on his deathbed. His change of heart brought delight to devoted relatives. It provided them solace that he had converted, although he was unable to live his entire life for Christ. A rose was placed on his casket. The sweet scent of the flower was a reminder of the victory of his, although late, turned to Christ. The petals lied motionless in the wooden case. The capsule was covered in velvet. It matched well with the rose. Thorns protruded from the vibrant viridian stem soaked with morning dew, ready to prick any observer. Marjorie picked the flower. Her father served as a testament to, to, to God's daily miracles. His untimely conversion reminded the audience that they would be in union with him in those pearly gates segre segregating sin from holiness. Marjorie was closest to her mother, and her father's reckless past was a path she would not follow. Her children were to grow up with humility, reverence, and devotion. The rose slipped from the wooden capsule and smashed to the ground. It went unnoticed. Why would a flower have to stimulate any attention? It was like any other flower, and it attracted no attention. The funeral procession continued. Soliloquy after soliloquy about prior connections with Marjorie's father ran the afternoon to, into night. He would be remembered for his unguided spirit, but as a symbol of God's mercies, he was now in heaven. The procession was a time for family to converge once again, connect, plan near-future luncheons, and discuss political affairs. Marjorie delivered a speech for her father that reflected somber undertones, yet a lingering expression of joy. She was in the first stage of grief, nonetheless, but she knew life would go on. It always had, and it probably always would. That was the way it was, is, and would be. She embraced her mother and clasped her hands. The silver wedding band her mother had worn for 59 years began to, to face the effects of oxidation. The chemistry between the air and the gold's band's chemical properties led to the symbol of love's brutal deterioration. Marjorie's mother and father had a healthy and steady marriage. Disease was never an issue of concern, and their love for one another overcame the typical arguments married couples had. Marjorie, like Jeffrey, were plunged under their mother's desire to bring them up in a religious setting. The severity of their religious beliefs was not as stringent as of their parents, but they still had convictions. Religion was a great thing. It provided hope for a brighter future, a sense of guidance, and a sense of purpose. After all, what would our purpose be? Purpose as humans be if celestial beings hadn't placed us on earth? 
Religion is justified in these aspects and is truly a beautiful concept for so many people. The birth of William meant new beginnings for Marjorie and Geoffrey. It was a boy. Celebration across the hospital room illuminated the somber Topeka evening. Blue banners draped the cell that Marjorie had spent the past nine hours. New outfits stitched by both grandmothers would provide warmth to the baby William, just as a mother dresses her child in excessive winter coats on a chilly day. The grandfather could no longer conceal his childlike happiness for William's conception. As death had taken the lives of so many others, a new life had been generated. For all they knew, William could find the cure to terminal illnesses such as influenza, could be the President of the United States, could even be a man of wealth. But what they did know for certain was that he would carry on the cycle of life and have children of his own one day. That's the way it had been done for, gen for generations, and the way it would be done. In a world of uncertainty, Marjorie and Jeffrey knew that they would have grandchildren one day. Marjorie had always wanted a child, and Jeffrey had delayed her wish for more than ten years. Marjorie was lucky to have conceived her baby. Infertility was more common at the age of 40. Although William was removed from his mother's stomach, he was healthy. William beamed of hope for the now nuclear family. An extension to the 4 Paulson lineage, the family grew. The family which William was born to was far from perfect, but he had inherent ex expectations nonetheless. William Emmanuel Foro was the first and only child of Marjorie and Geoffrey. The train that transported the couple and their newborn back to their home was empty. The desolate environment cast Marjorie into a fear as it, as it was now pitch black outside. Bird chirps had been replaced by owl hooting in the distance. The eeriness of their sounding environment juxtaposed the pleasant setting established at William's conception. The train made a creaking sound when it made periodic stops, and the moon's reflection struck the glass windows which gave the inside a more natural light. The inside lights of the train had been burnt out, and the replacement had been neglected. Marjorie felt at peace as she found serenity in her no newborn's blue eyes. William distracted Marjorie from the unsettling environment and replicated a serenity Marjorie had believed could only be found in heaven. Heaven on earth was William wrapped in light, teal-colored linens, laying asleep in Marjorie's lap. Geoffrey struggled to stay awake as he had been awake for over twenty hours tending to Marjorie's pregnancy affairs. He looked over at Marjorie and smiled faintly, displaying his satisfaction with his contribution to the family lineage. He drifted off into slumber while his wife examined the baby, making sure that there was nothing wrong with her newborn. His unconsciousness removed his observation of William's soft whimpers that kept Marjorie awake. Dreams were not common in this city, and if they, if they occurred, they were crushed by reality. The stagnant nature of life in the city fostered no sense of difference, but rather conformity, conformity to a life dominated by traditionalism. William had no choice in the matter. He was in Topeka by chance and was to grow up here by his parents' choice. First day of first grade. Brown leaves covered the doormat that led into Parsons Elementary School. The sound of leaves crunching under the shoes of drowsy children and their parents along with a cloudy gray sky made for a calm Kansas morning in August. Teachers made last-minute transportation of materials into their classroom be classrooms be before school began. Students must be in their assigned seats by 7.40 a.m. or they will be marked hardy, read one of the signs on Mrs. Blaylock's doorframe. Mrs. Blaylock taught penmanship to the incoming pre-adolescents, a subject she considered to be an art. William sat in his seat as class began, while the other children were talking amongst themselves. The boys huddled together, talking about how the girls were repulsive, and the girls the same. Childhood rivalry toward the opposite gender was the predominant setting before Miss Blaylock got the class under control. William refrained from involvement in the rivalry, not because he wanted to, but because he was shy. Marjorie and Geoffrey perceived, perceived him to be socially inept even for his young age as he never talked to any of the male children in his vicinity. He was also deathly afraid of girls, afraid that they would judge him. William had worries that none of his peers had. Something was different about him, and Mrs. Blaylock noticed this when he would not play with other children his age during the last few minutes of class allotted to socializing. She had sympathy toward him in his isolation from other boys and girls, probably because he was her best student. William always paid attention to detail, made sure his cursive T's were crossed, double-checked that his letters were in between the lines. His distinction did not go unnoticed. Jeffrey assumed William had obsessive compulsive disorder and advised he be taken to a psychiatrist for a diagnosis. Marjorie was averse to this idea. She believed it was unnecessary to take a first grader to a psychiatrist. William always paid meticulous attention to detail, not only in the penmanship course, but also in his English and history courses. The level of work required to succeed in these courses was not demanding as the students were only children. William's attitude toward being the best in his classes was not mere competition, but rather an internal struggle for validation. Something incremental to his life was missing, and neither him nor his parents were able to figure out what it was. Life went on. 
William entered the fifth grade, and he had finally broken out of the cage that shyness had constrained him to. His best friends, Aaliyah and Alicia, accompanied William during lunch, recess, physical education class, and after school. There was a certain bond between the three that was exclusive to them at Parsons. The bond was of the nurturing kind, but also the playful. William teased Alicia, Alicia teased Aaliyah, and Aaliyah teased William. What distinguished the friendship from others in the grade was that there was no awkwardness between the three, despite the inclusion of both genders. The relationship broke the traditional norm of elementary education friendships. Every other friend group consisted of exclusively males or exclusively females. Other males in the grade teased William about having a crush on both Aaliyah and Alicia, to which he vehemently objected. Why was their friendship free of friction deriving from typical gender norms? William's close connection to Aaliyah and Alicia was constantly scrutinized by teachers at Parsons, but made Jeffrey a proud father. Jeffrey insists that William was starting young, and that he and Marjorie must have the talk with him soon. Marjorie countered with the fact that he was only ten, and that he was not mature enough for such a conversation. Sex was a forbidden act if completed outside of marriage, and Marjorie made sure to accentuate this to Jeffrey. Jeffrey was not a virgin when he had married Marjorie, something that prompted her to stain. They decided to instruct William about the importance of saving himself for marriage, and that the right girl would come around. No one was able to grasp the fact that the relationship between Aaliyah, Alicia, and William was entirely platonic. Aaliyah and Alicia had no interest in William, and William no interest in them. Why did friendships involving both genders always have to have an underlying sexual motive? Societal misconceptions should not be toward children's relationships. Why complicate something this that was beautiful? William never understood why his male acquaintances at Parsons always investigated his connection with his best friends. He had no feelings toward either of them. For a matter of fact, he had never had feelings for anyone. William was not a cynic, but rather a child. Children should not be required to have affection toward anyone, especially not at, the eight, especially not at ten years of age. What was awkward for William was that all the male students in his grade had crushes on Aaliyah and Alicia, and everyone suspected he did too. He was alienated on the grounds of jealousy. How come William had it so easy with interacting with the two prettiest girls in the grade? Male students flung name after name unto him, and never included him in recess activities or after-school games. Marjorie and Jeffrey were alarmed by the polarization that was formed between William and the other male students. The two parents contacted the principal at Parsons to discuss their concerns and were written off as being worrisome. The issue was nothing more than mere jealousy. The boys simply wanted what William had, the principal said. William never easily facilitated a connection with any male in his class. He began, increasing, he began increasingly making more female friends, however, and they filled any void that could have been filled by male companionship. His entrance into middle school was marked with increased segregation between other, other male students and himself. He had nothing against the other male students, he just didn't have the same connection he did with his female friends. Mrs. Watkins, a 7th grade social studies teacher at Branson Middle Years Academy, noticed the disparity between William and the other male students. Her seating arrangement was altered so that she could include, even if forced, William into the all-male study group. He enjoyed the history of the United States, French Revolution, the Enlightenment, but ambition was looked down upon. He never truly exposed his intellectual abilities in fear of receiving a label characterizing him as a nerd. Societal pressures sunk him down to inferiority and complacency. William was too afraid to be himself in front of the students in his new study group. He was in a new environment, after all, so it was understandable. He rarely opened his mouth during brainstorming, something his group disliked. His contributions were minimal, despite being the most well-versed in history affairs. His mind confiscated his speaking abilities during third period, and his participation grade dropped. Marjorie and Jeffrey once again were surprised by their son's dropping grade. The stellar nature of William Fora was compromised by his uneasiness around those like him. On every physical level, he was the same as those in his study group. He was smaller than most of the other males at Branson, so his parents concluded that his dissociation with other males was due to lack of body positivity and insecurity. The boys, unlike William, were in touch with reality. Their reality was different than William's. The disparity in his conversation and mannerisms displayed a male, but a femininity. He wondered why he felt so strikingly different than his male peers and began to delve in self-loathing. He would lay awake trying to complement his inherent difference that segregated himself from the boys in his grade. Thunderstorms in his conscience drenched his eyes and turned them velvet. He was fighting a war against something he did not quite know. The damage incurred would serve as a reminder to quit being so damn emotional. Something his grandfather would say to his father. Expression of emotion was a female characteristic in the Poro lineage. He realized he could not fit the paragon his grandfather had represented. Emotion overcame him and induced him into a drowsiness that would end when he awoke. This cycle continued for years and contrasted with a generational cycle of traditionalism. Attempts to suppress what hid in the back of his mind challenged his desire for validation. He yearned for comfort from what he was experiencing, but he was also vehement against straying away from the example set by his grandfather, great-grandfathers. 
Denial punished his denial punished his desire to be free. But what freedom did he desire? Was it freedom from traditional family opinion, or was it from the bomb that detonated in his conscience that brought realization? He was just now beginning the arduous journey to self-actualization. The very thought of his existence challenged his existence. He was a wooden ship that was being tossed around by unsteady waves of fear. Fear of his family's reaction. Fear of society's reaction. Fear of his friends' reactions. Uncertainty flooded his mind as water rushes through a ruptured dam. When he concluded his journey to self-actualization, he was hammered to the crucifix of disdain. No tears could wash away the pain that no tears could wash away the pain caused by fear. The veil separating his individuality and facade was torn in two. It is finished. William understood the disparity between himself and other boys his age. He understood the awkwardness and uncomfortable feeling following conversation with his male classmates. It explained his lack of male friends and dependence on females for companionship. His emotions matched their emotions, as did his mannerisms, hobbies, and television preferences. William decided that no one was to know of his realization. In a field of flowers, he was a blue orchid. His deviation from, from societal norms coerced him under a perception that he was an outcast. His divergence plunged him into a state of mental disarray. He was forced to contemplate his relationship with family, friends, teachers, mentors. He believed that he would never be able to escape repression from those with opposing beliefs. Religion served as the nail in the coffin to his attempts at accepting his identity. Deriving from a lineage of devoted Protestants and Catholics, William feared the implications of their beliefs. The monster that hung over his shoulder was whether his family would sustain their beliefs. It was not fair that his entire existence would be decided by ancient manuscripts. He was 16 years old. He should have been enjoying walks under the cool autumn air that welcomed the changing of season, watching the painted sunset transition to a moonlit darkness. He should have had the ability to be honest. Ironic how honesty was emphasized at their weekly Sunday gatherings, but William's honesty would prove injurious to others' perceptions of him. Why should he be honest and convey his truth when others would vehemently squelch it? He began to understand why his grandfather criticized the world's cruelty. His relationships with women always fell through. For William, however, he never would have to experience the world's cruelty in this regard. Relationships were only open to those who could express their feelings to others. Fear of opposition was a blockade to his innermost emotions, and freedom to express these emotions was also checked by potential opposition. He decided that he would rather die with this secret than to divulge it to his friends or family. Any secret worth dividing a family over was one that should not be said. This cemented William's decision to conceal the truth, to conceal his identity. A blue orchid in a field of flowers, he was different. His difference cost him his relationship and trust with his parents. He neglected their decision to place religion over modern affairs. He began to perceive religion as a thing of the past, something he had tried to give up. His past would stymie his personal growth as it would serve to haunt his future self. This future self was reflective of his identity and not a facade used for deceptive purposes. William grew older and so did his identity. He had a craving for love, something he felt that he had lost from his parents. His parents were unaware of the life he was living and were blindsided as to why the connection between parent and son faded. William accepted, accepted his identity, but he was too afraid to inform others of it. Kansas was not a prime environment for someone like William to express his diversity. While diversity may have been welcomed elsewhere, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. The 1950s was consumed by Cold War tensions and U.S.-Soviet Union rivalries. Communist hysteria extended into the social climate. Social is issues and deviations to the American norm were labeled as communists, regardless of the subject. William was proud of how far he had come in terms of self-acceptance. He had once hated himself and had relied on self-loathing to hopefully change his attraction from males to females. Marjorie noticed a change in William, and she began to make daily checkups on him. Her son, had grown in, her son had grown up into a fine young man, but he had not permitted her entrance into his life. He made every attempt possible to avoid the topic altogether, but was proud of himself for persevering despite potential opposition. It did not matter, however. What he knew in his heart was that he was happy with who, with who he was becoming. He was proud of his identity after so many years of hating himself for it. His journey to self-acceptance was finished. Note from the author. The point of this book was to take time and reflect on the inherent difficulty it is to be a member of the LGBTQ plus community. While it may be brushed under the rug, members of the LGBTQ plus community face not only discrimination from others, but even from family members. Although religion is a very beneficial source for for providing hope and guidance, it should not be used to impress one's belief on others. The United States is a country that ensures protections for all of its citizens. The right to practice religion is protected under the First Amendment to the Constitution. Civil rights legislation that supports pro-LGBTQ plus rights advancement is also endorsed by the federal government. I personally believe there should be respect for both religion and other smaller minority groups, such as the LGBTQ plus community. 
The blue orchid represents the protagonist, William, and the sadness that accompanies his journey to self-acceptance. It also represents his difference among the others. However, as is any flower, he is still beautiful, regardless of his difference. Thank you for listening to this book, and I hope it resonates with at least one person who did not previously support LGBTQ plus civil rights. Thank you again.